right? This has nothing to do with helping animals, but did you all hear that Sergey Brin bought the New York Times this morning? He buys it every morning. All right, so my name is Nick Cooney and I'm the Director of Education at Mercy for Animals, which is a farm animal protection organization. And um, Jeff spoke about some, some ideas and theories about what could be effective approaches to help animals. And as he mentioned, what I'm gonna focus on today are things that are going on right now. This year, last year, the past few years, that are having a major impact for millions of animals, and that are doing so at an extremely low cost per animal benefited. So to give you a little background on myself, uh, aside from being Director of Education at Mercy for Animals, I'm also the founder and chairman of the board at the Humane League, another farm animal protection organization. And I've written a few books on social change, the most recent being How to Be Great at Doing Good, why results are what count, and how smart charity can change the world, which as you may guess from the title, is a book about promoting an effective altruist, utilitarian approach to giving, and volunteering, and working at nonprofit organizations. Now despite the fact that I work at an animal protection organization and have done so for the past decade, I am not what you would consider or what some people would call an animal person. I never had pets growing up, I don't have pets today, I don't ever intend to, and while I think dogs and cats are cute, just like all of you do, I don't have any special affinity or bond for animals. Uh, back in college, this handsome gentleman you see before you, uh, when I was in college, I worked on all sorts of social issues, and yes, that, that is indeed me. So I worked on animal protection issues, but also worked on environmental issues, anti-poverty initiatives, human rights endeavors, but over a number of years, after dabbling in these different areas, I came to, to believe, and still do to this day, that the area where I could do the most good, help the greatest number of individuals, reduce the most animal suffering, was in the area of animal advocacy, and specifically in the area of farmed animal advocacy. And I maintain that belief today because of the massive proven impact of smart approaches to helping animals. And it's so, so it's some examples from that area that I want to go into today. So this is a battery cage, which JC mentioned earlier. This is where the majority of egg-laying hens in the United States are confined for the entire year and a half to two years of their life. Packed in a narrow cage so small they can barely turn around, cannot spread their wings, and living in these incredibly cruel conditions for their entire life. Now, while the majority of egg-laying hens are still confined in these situations, we are seeing some change. For example, since the start of this year, since January 1st, 2015, a campaign run by the Humane League has inspired the three largest food service providers in the country. The company is running college cafeterias and hospital cafeterias and so forth to commit to completely eliminating the use of battery cage eggs from their supply chain. And in fact, it's not just these three companies. 44 of the 50 largest food service chains in the country have all made this commitment and put a timeline in place to eliminate battery cages from their supply chains. All told, these changes will spare over five million animals every single year from the intense misery of cage confinement. And if we look at what was spent on this campaign, and the number of animals impacted just in the first year, we see that less than two cents was spent for every animal spared. And again, that's in year one. As we add up the years this policy is in effect, that number goes down, down from two cents. This is a gestation crate, which JC also mentioned. The majority of mother pigs in the United States are still confined in these gestation crates for the majority of their four years of life not even able to turn around. They can stand up, they can sit down, and that's it for their entire life. And these are animals just as smart, intelligent, curious, and most importantly, as sentient and able to feel pain and pleasure as dogs and cats and other animals. Again here, while the majority of mother pigs are still confined in these conditions, we are seeing change. In fact, just in the past six or seven months, some of the largest food industry companies 
in the country and in the world have committed to phasing gestation crates out of their supply chain in response to pressure campaigns from organizations like the Humane Society, Mercy for Animals, and the Humane League. And these include the companies shown here, Walmart, Nestle, and Starbucks. And just from these three companies alone, which have made commitments in the past six or seven months, once these commitments are fully implemented, there will be over 18 million animals spared every year at a cost of just five cents per animal whose life was made significantly better as a result of these changes. This is a veal crate. Many young male calves who are of no use to the dairy industry because they cannot produce milk and of no use to the beef industry because they're the wrong type of breed for beef cattle are still confined in individual veal crates or stalls, sometimes chained by the neck, barely able to move for their entire approximately three-month lifetime. But here, too, we are seeing change. So in the past seven or eight years, a growing number of states, thanks to legislative initiatives by the Humane Society of the United States, have banned the use of veal crates, as well as the use of gestation crates and battery cages. In fact, California, where we're all sitting today, as of 2015, the use of veal crates, gestation crates, or barren battery cages are now illegal in the state. Similar laws have been passed in Ohio, Michigan, and other states. And as a result of this, over 40 million animals will live lives with significantly less suffering. At a net cost, when we look at all the expenditures that went into bringing about these legislative victories, of less than 40 cents per animal spared. Now, these are some ways that the welfare of animals have been improved so that they suffer less during the entirety of their life. But another way that farm animal advocates are making a difference is by sparing animals from misery entirely, by reducing the demand for meats and milk and eggs, and thereby driving down the supply, decreasing the number of animals raised and killed in these facilities. Turkeys and chickens are perhaps the most abused animal on the face of the planet. They are packed by the billions into barren factory farm sheds with no access to natural light, no access to the outdoors, living on the waste of generations of previous birds with ammonia filling the air, bred to grow so unnaturally fast that they often suffer from crippling heart disease and leg disorders in the short six weeks they have before they're slaughtered. While the conditions are indeed grim for these animals, thanks to reductions in meat consumption, far fewer chickens and turkeys are suffering in these ways each year. And here's one example of a campaign that is bringing that about. So a few organizations, primarily the Humane Society of the US and to a lesser extent the Humane League, have succeeded in getting some very large school districts to implement Meatless Monday policies in their school cafeterias, where only meat-free meals are served one day a week. And because so many children eat lunch and some of them breakfast at school, this means a significant reduction in the amount of meat being purchased by these districts. And districts as large as Los Angeles and Oakland and Newark, New Jersey and Buffalo and others have made and stuck with this commitment to go meatless on Monday. And as a result of these institutional victories, there's over four million animals each year being completely spared from a lifetime of misery at a campaign cost of less than 20 cents per animal, which again, is only in year one. So that 20 cents goes down once we consider the lifetime effects of these new policies. One other example of the cruelty of animal agriculture. Each year there's about 280 million male chicks born on hatcheries across the United States. Chicks who have no value to the egg industry because they cannot lay eggs and they have no value to the chicken meat industry because they're not the right breed to be raised for meat. And so they're killed at just a few days old by being dropped alive and fully conscious into giant grinding machines. On some facilities, instead of grinding machines, they simply suffocate the chicks in large plastic bags. And this is going on to nearly 300 million male chicks every single year. One other way that this and other cruelties are being reduced, successfully reduced, is by reducing consumer demand for these products. So if we look at per capita meat consumption in the United States, it has dropped by 10% since 2007. 
The average American is eating 10% less meat than they were just a decade ago. And if we look at the numbers, we see some of this is due to increases in price and other factors. But a significant portion of this decrease is due to a decrease in demand. People are eating less meat because they want to eat less meat. And as a result, the number of animals raised in factory farms and enduring a lifetime of misery in these places has been going down almost year after year after year for the past decade. In fact, all told, there's 400 million fewer animals that will be raised on factory farms or farms at all in the US this year as a result of the reduction in consumer demand, with much of that due to a decrease in actual demand for the product. So organizations like the ones I've mentioned and others are working to reduce this demand by things such as distributing books and magazines and printed literature and leaflets, sharing videos and documentaries exposing the cruelties of factory farming and the health impacts of diets high in animal products, and distributing materials online, on websites, and online news articles, and so forth. And large-scale studies of those who have cut back on meat or cut out meat entirely have found that the majority of this change was triggered by these sorts of interventions. So all told, the number of animals being spared as a result of these activist interventions seems to be roughly in the realm of 150 million animals per year. And it's hard to put a price tag on the cost per animal spared there, but the entire farm animal protection movement and vegetarian and vegan advocacy and meat reduction advocacy movement in the US, all rolled into one, spends only tens of millions of dollars per year. So we see here, too, an incredibly low cost per animal spared. And that's really the heart of what I'm trying to get across here. You know, of all the important causes out there and the important causes being discussed here this weekend, there are few, if any others, where literally the change in our pocket, a few pennies, a few dimes, a quarter or two, can spare a smart, unique individual, and again, sentient individual from a lifetime of misery. But smart farm animal advocacy is an area where you and I can accomplish that. And this is where it comes back to each of you. There are two main constraints right now in the movement to help farmed animals. One is a lack of talent. There are certainly some very intelligent, effective altruists, utilitarian, and just generally effective get things done people in the movement. And that is why we've seen the sort of victories that I was talking about. But as our organizations grow and we're able to do more, it is a struggle to find really talented, really smart, and really effective people to fill the new positions opening up. So I hope that all of you will consider volunteering, interning, and potentially working with some of these high impact farm animal protection charities. And secondly, of course, the second main constraint is financial constraints. There is huge room for growth in the farm animal protection movement. We need more resources and we can do much more good, create much more of the sort of change I was talking about as more resources come in. And as JC mentioned, animalcharityevaluators.org is a great place to go to get some really good database suggestions of which charities will help the greatest number of animals with each dollar you donate. Right now, the three charities at the top, the Humane League, Mercy for Animals, and Animal Equality, are ACES three recommended charities, and Veg Fund, the Humane Society, and Vegan Outreach are three other groups that either ACE and or myself also believe to be doing very high impact work. So please consider supporting, volunteering, and applying to work at these and other high impact farm animal advocacy organizations. That's pretty much it for me. For anyone else who's interested in learning more about what Mercy for Animals is doing, you can find out at mercyforanimals.org. And there's my email. I'd love to hear from you, chat with you, talk to you about opportunities in this field if it's something that you're interested in. So thanks to all, you all so much.